Uh, not that the other ones are of less importance, but this session is about boosting the economy with creative industries and obviously their combination with cultural heritage. Um, if you look at um, Marcel's presentation earlier and also the, the, um, the structure of the Europeana Space Project, the end goal is to show how actually digital, digitized cultural heritage materials, when combined with the creative industries, can show financial gain. Uh, that's what the goal of this project is. It's also the same goal that the, the sister project of Europeana Creative showed. And it's also still one of the most elusive things uh, posing the cultural heritage sector today. Um, so in this session, uh, my colleague and I, Simon Cronshaw, who helped me run, uh, well, yeah, who helped me run Work Package 5 in the Europeana Space Project. Um, uh, we will discuss how we went about um, developing sustainable business models for the seven incubated projects that you have almost heard from all of them today. But before, and then we will have a panel discussion with the incubated projects and Simon and myself to kind of have a frank discussion about this topic. Um, but to hear from, I believe, the final incubated project, I would like to present Moshe Sakal all the way from Tel Aviv or Jerusalem? From Tel Aviv. So uh, Moshe, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gregory, whom I know from the US, by the way. I'm going to tell you about our new website on which you can send a postcard of a new work of art written in hand. Can you remember the feeling of receiving a postcard from a beloved one? The great surprise, the feeling of being thought of, the sensation of discovering new art. And I'm sure all of you recollect the special moment of reading for the very first time a message written for your eyes only. Hold it for a second. In our days of super fast high-tech environment, this feeling is completely lost. And that is exactly what we wish to bring back to the world. Thanks to Gluya, anyone will be able to send an art postcard from our high-end curated gallery with a personal message to his beloved ones and with a fair price. But first, what does Gluya mean? Well, Gluya, a postcard in Hebrew, my, one of my mother tongues, also means something that is revealed, uncovered, something that is brought to light. It is a word that implies a situation in which a riddle is about to be solved, something in the open. It is finally a sort of a discovery. Our platform is a web-curated gallery store that offers users to send high-end art images to anyone they love in the form of a postcard. With just one click, you simply choose a piece of art, enter a personal message, address, and send. We deal with the rest, including, a hand write, including handwriting your message to add a personal retro kick. How does it work? Well, we contact contemporary artists, only those fresh and promising new faces from major art scenes around the globe. Gluya is a win-win platform for the artist. A, the concept, the elevation of postcards to art tattoos. B, the role of postcards as a channel for reaching new audiences and leading to awareness and sales for the artist. C, promotion on site and free marketing. D, commission the artist will earn, and all this without having to do almost anything to join. Back to the platform. The user goes over the works and chooses the one he likes. He or she fill in the recipient's name and address and then types a message. Once the message is in the system, we print the postcard, have the message handwritten. Yes, by hand, really. For these are the days of returning to analog. Then we put a stamp and the postcard is on its way. Last but not least, Gluya will offer the service also to third-party businesses. Using our website, the art galleries and museums will be able to stay in touch with their audiences in a new and engaging way. Explore, touch, send, 
Let them know you think about them. Thank you. This is, by the way, the artist, not my colleague. My colleague is Yair Dovrat, who is now in Tel Aviv. We've been to Venice and then to London with Simon. And the rest we'll talk about later on, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Moshe. Um, this, I, I very much enjoy this product because it will change my relationship with my mother who is desperately asking for postcards from everywhere I go and she receives zero. So, bringing people together. <laughs> okay, so start the timer. Okay, hello, I am back in a different capacity. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, um, Simon and myself ran Work Package 5, which was about the innovation space of the Europeana Space Project. And our goal, by the end of this project, was to pre present six projects that could stand on their own feet uh, financially or at least uh, having a feasible, sustainable business model that once the project ended, these products could then enter the market and be market compatible and be competitive on the market. And all these projects would be reusing digital cultural heritage in some form. How did we get these projects? Well, we had six hackathons. Uh, all the six of these hackathons were around different themes. And well, you know how a hackathon works. We invited people to come work with some content around a certain set of parameters and see what kind of creative creativity came out. Uh, we held hackathons all across Europe, and each hackathon was very different than the one that came before it. Uh, they were run in different ways, the participants were different, the energy was different, but all of them surprised us in, in many different ways in terms of the outcomes and the enthusiasm of the participants that held them. For some institutions, this was the first hackathon that they, they had organized or participated in, and it was also very uh, exciting to see how uh, their eyes kind of lit up when they saw what could be done with their content. But hackathons don't scream sustainable products, as some of you who may have had a hackathon in the past. Most of the time, everything that comes out of it, out, comes out of the hackathon, well, it just, it just dies, and it ends up in the GitHub graveyard, and it's never seen again. Obviously, that's not what we wanted for this project. So, we had written in our description to work, this thing is called a monetization workshop. Well, monetization, that's kind of selling false hope of being able to make money right away. So we decided to call them business modeling workshops because that's really what we were trying to do. We were trying to find sustainable business models. So at each hackathon, we picked three winners, and these three winners were brought to London to the offices of Simon Remix. Well, kind of a satellite office, if you will. Um, and during this one-day workshop, their ideas were essentially torn apart and put back together through lenses that Simon will talk about shortly. And then the strongest idea coming out of these business modeling workshops was then chosen to move on to incubation. And in the back, and today, you have heard from seven of them because, well, there were just so many good ideas that we had to pick just one extra. Um, so overachieving, if you will. But after that, these projects went on to incubation with Simon. Um, and the incubation was tailored around the specific products and knowing the ins and outs of them. Um, again, Simon will talk about how that went. We only have 10 minutes, though, and I've already gone over. Um, but so that's it. And then the project ends in February. And we hope to see these products that have come out of the European Space Project enter the market and be competi competitive and make an impact. Um, I think it's very important that we see uh, that, that we that cultural heritage institutions team up with the creative industries, uh, especially younger generations. Um, Cultural heritage can be very dry, and it can still be a very academic ivory tower uh, realm that works within its own little bubble. And by introducing the creative sector in younger generations and um, not putting too many restrictions on them in terms of what they can do with the content, you can really find the value in the context and the content that exists within our, with, exists within our collections. Um, I think one of the best examples, and though maybe the lowest level of this example, was some casual swearing that we saw from Nora. It's something that you wouldn't see very often in a museum curation, but this is the way people talk sometimes. And I think it's very important that um, these collections and our context can be translated to younger generations in a way that they can relate to it and appreciate it and not feel like it's just another lecture in class. So that's what we did in Work Package 5 over three years, three years in four minutes. And now Simon will take it over for the nitty gritty ins and outs of how we work this way. Okay, thanks.
a lot smaller. Okay, um, so today I just want to have a quick sort of recap on where, where I've come from, where Remix has come from. Uh, almost 10 years ago now, we set up culturalable.com, which we brought together 800 museum stores from around the world. All the UK nationals and people like Guggenheim, MoMA, all came together brought a quarter of a million monthly visitors to the site, mainly from the high street, not necessarily people that go to museums, but for many this was their first step into the world of museums, galleries and arts organisations. We went through several rounds of funding from angels and venture capitalists and then we sold it in 2014, so we've been focusing on our other baby since then, Remix Summits. Um, which is really looking at the conversation in this space. So culture, cross with technology, cross with entrepreneurship. There's so much great stuff happening in those three worlds that when you bring the best brains from each together into a room, explosions and great stuff happens. The next one, a quick plug, is in January, Remix London, 18th and 19th of January at Google and Ace Hotel. If you want further details, the website's on the screen. Um, in addition to that, we also run co-working spaces for 60 entrepreneurs in London. We just set up one in, in, in collaboration with an institution in Australia, and really looking at how institutions can work with this new generation of creative entrepreneurs to really leverage the skills of both the institution and the entrepreneur. And also some of our clients we work with on things like commercial strategies, a whole range of other sort of visitor journey strategies, including the first commercial strategy for the UK Houses of Parliament and a user strategy for the Library, State Library of Victoria in Australia. Now, going back to the beginning, cultural entrepreneurship, this is the equation you've probably seen to death if you've heard me speak. I always, always, always come back to this. It's that combination of what we do, what we're good at, our cultural assets, combined with consumer trends, mix them together to find the opportunity. Find where we can insert our cultural activity into people's everyday lifestyles, at home, at work, at school, at play. Then we use the tried and tested techniques of entrepreneurs to make it happen, get it out there, not waiting for the check to arrive, not waiting for the public funding, not waiting for the sponsors, get it started, get it out there into the marketplace, and that results in new revenue and new audience development. So when we come to incubating projects around um, this whole sort of cultural entrepreneurship world, we see this kind of chain of innovation, and we've, we've come up with these kind of six eyes. It never happens in this linear fashion. You get these different phases happening at different times, different ideas bubbling away at the same time as you're implementing other ones. But basically, the six areas are kind of inspiration, seeing what else is happening out there. What are people in other sectors doing? Let's escape this bubble of the cultural sector and let's see what media is doing, let's see what publishing is doing, let's see what events are doing, let's see what retail is doing, let's see what every other sector is doing. And from that, find insights that we can apply to the cultural sector, to the art sector, and come up with thousands and thousands and thousands of ideas for entrepreneurship out of that inspiration. Then from that, we can choose the ones that have got legs. We can choose the ones that are worth pursuing and investing in. That takes us to the innovation stage. Then we implement it, make it happen, and then we look at the impact of that innovation. Now, I want to, first of all, concentrate on the first, first part of this equation, looking at inspiration, insights, ideas. Where do we get those those combinations of assets and trends that finds the right idea for entrepreneurship in the arts and culture sector? Well, there's four areas that I just want to very briefly race through, conscious time. Those four areas are basically what makes us cultural institutions and all the great assets we have at our disposal. Firstly, content. We're brimming with collections, performances, expertise of staff, of academics. We've got the context around objects, the context around performances, all that knowledge that's in our organization. We've got characters. We've got a whole, st a whole range of fictional and, and other kind of characters. We've got access that people would love to have, behind the scenes access, accessing artists, a whole range of content assets at our disposal. So that's what we've got. If we look at what's happening in the wider world around content, there are huge developments. Just look online at all the editorial formats that are bubbling up. Look at something like Upworthy.com, or look at something like TED Talks, or look at a 
in closer to the cultural space, 100 objects from the British Museum. Really interesting formats that don't just involve someone standing facing a camera for half an hour. There's some really, really interesting content formats that the rest of the world is coming up with. How can we apply some of those to the creative and cultural sectors to take our objects, to take our stories, to take our performances and apply them in a genuinely interesting, exciting way? Secondly, spaces. Now, obviously, eSpace is focused on content, so I'll race through these other three. But spaces create a huge amount of opportunities, whether it's our permanent buildings, whether it's the temporary setups that we can have, the pop-up spaces, uh, whether it's indoor, outside, whether it's public spaces, private spaces. All of these different assets we have at our disposal, how can we start to map out these different spaces and then look at what other sectors are doing with their use of space? An obvious example would be the car park, the public car park, disused public, disused public car park in Peckham, quite a rundown part of London, that was turned into a rooftop bar and totally regenerated the area as a result of an artist called Hannah Barry that really kind of led the culture-led regeneration of that area. That took imagination to think, what can we do with a disused car park that was built but the supermarket didn't follow it. Those kind of initiatives really kind of give us options and, and opportunities for cultural entrepreneurship. Similarly, knowledge. All of our institutions have got so much knowledge that we can turn into entrepreneurial activities. Whether it's subject knowledge and our expertise and our specialisms around the assets we have, or whether it's processes, whether we can sell the way in which we hang art, the sort of sell the way in which we curate, sell the way in which we educate, the processes that underlie all of the day-to-day -day activities we do as an institution. And then finally, networks. As an institution, we're brimming with lots of different communities coming together in our space. And that might be users, it might be staff, academics, artists, ambassadors, businesses, education, tourists. There's probably a list of hundreds more that you can add to that list. How do we create points of intersection between all of these different communities and out of that create new products, new opportunities for introducing communities to each other, whether it's through events models, whether it's through publishing models, a whole range of untapped opportunities. So that between that content, knowledge, network spaces, there's literally thousands of ideas there waiting to be tapped into from every organization in the arts and cultural sector. There's so many opportunities not yet thought of that this becomes the space where it's at for the next decade or two. Then this is where the incubation comes in. How do we make those ideas happen? How do we go from idea to reality? And in practice, this is the hardest part of the equation. It's easy to have lots of great ideas. It's difficult to make it happen. The first and most important aspect of this, and we've touched on it at different parts of the day, is finding the right language. Now, I'm going to say something controversial, but I'll say it anyway, I tend to do this. It's by far the biggest challenge of the cultural sector to make ourselves relevant to people that don't already go to galleries or museums or arts organisations. We tend to find most people on the high street or at home put up brick walls as soon as you mention the word gallery, art, museum, anything that's kind of overtly cultural tends to kind of get people glazing over. And some of the most innovative, creative and cultural entrepreneurs come up with language that touches people, come up with words that actually mean things in people's everyday lifestyles. It's almost culture by stealth. And culture by stealth works because it gets people over a lot of the uh, preconditions and a lot of the perceptions that it would otherwise have. So firstly, reflecting trends. How are people behaving at home, at work, at school, at play? How can we take what we do and place it into an everyday context beyond our existing or obvious audiences? How do we take some of the great content we have and think of a way to insert it into the high street or into the home environment in a very natural, organic way? How do we reflect humanity? This is about language. How do we be talk in a simple way, an emotive way, an empathetic way, a jargon-free way. Um, we, we had a great talk in the Sydney event earlier this year where p somebody put up um, several mission statements from arts organisations. Every single one used virtually the same six words. And it was so, so, so dull and such a turn-off for anyone that wasn't in that sector. How do we start to talk about 
the rich creative cultural assets that we have in language that means something to people. And this is such an important one. The English National Ballet did a great example. I haven't got it on a slide, but um, I'll share it with people later. And it's basically talking about the richness of dance and how that transforms people's perceptions of their own existence. And when you get a mission statement like that, instantly your ears start to listen. So that ties into capturing what's special. Stir something within people or else it will fail. If you're just talking in a very static, very organizational, very inhuman kind of way, people aren't going to engage with it on that deeper emotional level. And as a result, the project will hit barriers. The project will hit lots of brick walls. So find ways of communicating with people as if they're people, as if they're just a friend in the pub or a friend at home. How do you chat to somebody that doesn't work in the cultural sector? So they're the three sort of aspects around the right language. And then the final area is then making it happen. Now, I can talk for days about this, but there are a few key areas that I just want to dive into. We wrote a book back in 2007 called Intelligent Naivety, which sets out 56 trends, sorry, 56 strategies entrepreneurs use to go from idea to reality. You can get a free download of that at remixsummits.com. And that's a great way of just kind of distilling lots of different strategies across staff cultures, across finance, across a whole range of marketing and a whole range of other areas that just bring together this act of doing in a creative, instant way. Now, if we're looking at finance, most people would say, oh, I can't possibly do this until someone pays for it. Can't possibly get started until I've got some money. Fortunately, we've got lots of different sources of finance now. We've got grants, we've got crowdfunding, we've got equity, we've got debt, we've got self-funding, lots of different areas that no longer restrict us just to traditional grant funding. But what I think is important here is the model that lies behind it. And the second model, uh, the raise and find model, seems to be the way that most people think in this space. And it's a way that's encouraged by a lot of startup schools and a lot of entrepreneur uh, courses and activities, where you raise a lot of cash, whether it's from private sources or public funds, and you basically spend it and hope that you don't run out of money before you come up with a sustainable model. Now, time and time again, that's the model that people use for funding new creative projects or funding businesses in general. The bootstrap model, and this was popularized by the Lean Startup, is the idea of actually getting your customers, find ways of getting a very basic product out into the marketplace. Don't polish it, don't make it perfect, just get something that's good enough and get it out there, spend 2,000 euros instead of 20,000 euros to get it just about good enough, get it out there into the marketplace, get people engaging with it, ideally get people paying for it, and then once you've proven that it's worth investing in, then you can take it as a realistic business case to a whole range of investors, whether it's a crowd, whether it's private sources, whether it's public funders, and it's at that growth part of the equation you invest in it. So rather than investing in an idea, they're investing in a proven model. But I would also argue that time and focus is as important, if not more so important, than finance. More often than not, most startups that we've worked with struggle with this. Most institutions we work with struggle with this. And one of the things we say in a lot of the workshops we run is what happens if we were to budget time as much as we budget cash? How do we find ways of tying together all that time that's at our disposal that's wasted on Facebook or wasted in our emails or wasted on pointless projects that achieve no objectives and actually reassign that time to stuff that has an outcome, to a focused project that's worth investing in? And then finally, skills and knowledge, whether it's the founders, whether it's the team, whether it's the advisors you surround yourself with, whether it's getting people in at the moment of growth to get the expertise around that. The people around a, co a creative idea are as important as the idea itself. And finally, this idea of leverage. So for everything you secure, whether it's a check, whether it's a partner, whether it's a first customer, whether it's a tweet, whatever it is, use that to get your second one. Then use those two to get your third one. Then use those three to get your fourth one. And keep going. Tell people that you've had those first three checks or those first three tweets or those first three customers or whatever it may be. The power of the crowd becomes really important there. It grows and grows and grows as you get that momentum. Unfortunately, it becomes a much bigger movement as you're leveraging, whether it's people, partners, buzz and media activity, or whatever it may be. So finance, time and focus, skill, and leveraging, four big areas for making it more likely to make an idea happen. 
Now, the um, final sort of aspect that I just want to talk about is um, the, the Remix London event that's coming up. I'm not doing a blatant plug for it. It's a bit of a little plug for it, but it's one of the key things for a lot of activities that we see is finding an opportunity to, find, to listen to trends, to find collaborators, to have inspiration and ideas about what we can do as cultural entrepreneurs, to take notes from what's worked and what hasn't worked with other entrepreneurs, and to find sources of finance. And that's what we do at, at Remix. We bring together the world of culture, technology, entrepreneurship to have those honest conversations, to meet each other, and I just, um, and, and to sort of compare notes, I just want very briefly to play a one minute video from Sydney just to give you a sense of what we do. We got some. We got sound. Remix is a pretty unique bringing together of this kind of world of culture, of technology and entrepreneurship. I, I don't know another conference like it in the world. Uh, Remix is important because it helps to bring people from various uh, cultural institutions together and actually share ideas and learn from one another. Always important for the you know, creative community to get together and have, have a forum to discuss uh, you know, everything from new ways to, to drive creativity and also you know, right down to things like how to make money. The question is, how can we re-educate a monotonous world through culture? It's important to focus on one's own version of success as opposed to necessarily marching to the beat of the drum of other people's success. It's important to bring people together who are change agents within their industry and who really let them exchange ideas without any immediate agenda on the table so that people can kind of digest what, what their experience is but also apply other, um, other benchmarks and other ideas to come up with something maybe fresh and new for their own work. And Remix is important because uh, it provides an opportunity for people like me, people who work in the, in the creative world, to interact with uh, people uh, who, who do a similar thing in different parts of the world, but also uh, who, who do something a bit different. As you start connecting great ideas, great people, you start getting a network effect of serendipity. And um, that's where innovation and creativity happens. Remix, it's really the, the specific mix of who comes that is exciting. Cool. So going back to the kind of the core theme of this, bringing together that innovation, those thought leaders, talking to each other, learning from people's expertise, learning from people's mistakes, getting people to chat through trends that are happening in other industries, not the cultural sector. That's where innovation happens, and that's what I'd really encourage you as entrepreneurs, as cultural entrepreneurs, to explore. Just put up a list of some of the people joining us in January. People at IBM, Secret Cinema, Royal Opera House, Sony Pictures, Design Museum, National Theatre, Dig Ventures, whole range of interesting people. I'll stop with the plug there, but hopefully, beyond the plug, there's this idea that actually bringing people with conflicting views from different industries, from different worlds, is where we get the secret source, where we'll learn for how to evolve the cultural and creative sectors in some interesting new ways. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, now um, is the final panel discussion, so I would like to invite uh, one representative from each of the incubated teams to the stage. Okay, so we only have 40 minutes, and as you guys saw in the mail, we have a lot of questions to go through. So 
I think the most important thing is just to let you guys do the talking. And so what I'm going to do is you are each going to get a different question because we've heard already about your projects today. So now we want to know more about your thought process and the process of building your projects. So we're going to go down the line here. And you all have microphones. So maybe the most generic, uh, but maybe most interesting for Picasso's cat, um, why did you think this idea in particular was worth pursuing, cats and arts? Um, so when I just started, uh, I, I really didn't plan to create my own team at the hackathon. But just before the hackathon, I read the news on this algorithm that allows you to transfer style. And when I finished reading it, I realized that I got to know something new. I learned something new about famous paintings that I didn't know. And I thought maybe if it was useful for me, who is like far away from art and like all this cultural area, maybe it's going to be useful for many other people who are also far away from a cultural area. And um, it seems to be very challenging to get people from, um, from the street into, into gallery, museum, or whatever. And I thought it's maybe a clever way how to you know, um, get, get them hooked and uh, get them into, <clears throat> into, into art, in a sense. So that's why I think it's very important to um, work with a simple language, work with a simple concept that would get people outside of the area interested in it. And that's why I think it's worth pursuing. Thanks. I think that's something we saw on almost everyone. You kind of all don't want to approach cultural heritage in the same maybe generic way. You're all coming up with different ideas from your own, own experiences of this is how I want to absorb culture, um, th or this is how my friends want to absorb culture. OK, so Alessandra, Team Nora. A team. Nora is now a product. Now you're not just a team anymore. Um, as entrepreneurs, what value do you see in the reuse of cultural heritage material, if any? Well, actually, the reuse of this kind of material could help the people to engage with, with these artifacts that, as a matter of fact, for certain people are hard to know, to understand and they can open also a market. So they, they work a lot, and they can be very useful. OK. Let's see, Paul. Serious question to ask you. So obviously, your, your product is big. And you need space, and you need spaces to display it. And you graciously got some funding from your piano. But in your mind, what do you think is the most important ingredient that's gonna, it's going to take to make your idea a success? The most important ingredient. I think um, it's obviously it's, we're, we're, we're on a, uh, uh, we're, it's on two legs. So it's on disclosing cultural archives and having that sort of new canvas and how can we bring art into that canvas. Uh, the other part, obviously, is about storytelling. And this is what I love and uh, uh, what I am really looking forward to work with. If people are looking at, at, a, at an artwork, what does that evoke? And what part of their lives is in there? Uh, so this is the thing that we are now uh, working on uh, most hardest, apart from all the coding stuff. is. How do you get that storytelling to that little uh, snippet that you want to collect, that people, when they walk away, they kind of sort of m m uh, remember it when they're on the train, thinking about this little story and uh, thinking about how that relates to their lives and how they can add those stories. And you see a couple of trends where people are now using, uh, people are talking into their devices more and more. Uh, maybe, I don't know about you, but a lot of people are using WhatsApp with little voice messages. Uh, I was in China lately and people only talk, you know, like a little, like they just have, you know, little voice, uh, voice stories. And having, collecting all of those stories around artworks, I think is, is amazing. I really look forward to, to see that happening. And, and now that we have the technology to set up an exhibition and to reach all of those people, so we sh we sh uh, shown the, the the idea of the of the billboards with, with which with one company you can set up a whole exhibition, but since this screen technology can be applied to 
a public space. It can be applied if you have if you have an office, you have a big screen in your in your in your lobby, and that gives you a different piece of art every day. That gives you a little piece of story every day. Then those kind of uh, uh, that that actually creates a, a broader. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I think it enriches an artwork like that. So we are look, now looking to work with uh, uh, partners who have this kind of infrastructure, and uh, and then on the content side, that that's when it, when it really becomes interesting. And this is what we're now. Uh, I have uh, we're working with some radio uh, producers who have a lot of um, experience with these little uh, uh, little pieces of storytelling. So this is uh, this is what we're working on now. Okay. So it's not that there's a, um, it's not that there's a disregard for maybe the for the historical context, but you maybe see it more. I think a lot of you also see it more the pers your personal connection with art. So not the historical metadata, um, which although we make known, I mean obviously digging deeper, that it is very intriguing. But for some of you, you want the personal connection that your friends have with art, not maybe what a curator has to say about the pieces of art. Or am I reading into that? No, no, absolutely. That's I, I think. But we, I think there's a lot of these projects. But I think it comes from the experience of going to a museum and sort of walking out puzzled, thinking like, okay, it's very important, uh, it's very expensive, and it's very revolutionary at a certain time. But actually, I don't really relate to it that much. And it's when a friend of you tells you about an artwork and tells you how that relates to to his life and how that r relates to, I don't know, like a, a small situation of his experience, that's when you remember it. When I think of all the artworks I remember, it's always when people talk, talk to me about it and said how that, I, I, there's a nice quote from uh, Alain de Botton when he says, when art is really, really good, then that basically you hold up an artwork and say, this is me, you know, like this is, this is what, what, uh, what, what I am about. And I think that's you know that's amazing if you can if you can establish that kind of relationship with an art piece. I think that's when you remember it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so Team Vivlio, um, there's actually a few questions I would like want to ask your team because you were interesting circumstances that you guys were maybe almost already a company at the hackathon. Um, so we could talk a lot about the business pers business perspective, but. Your first book being Tom Sawyer is one of the most dense pieces of works in American literature. Um, so how did you, and there's so much around it, how did you come up with this idea? Well, you know, how are you approaching the book, and not just the book itself, but also all the extra information that comes up around it? Why did you think this was important? Enriching text. Okay, I mean, um, uh, I'm first gonna talk about uh, why we started doing uh, classic books, basically. We were already a publishing business uh, serving other publishers, and the hackathon gave us the chance to do our own thing. And uh, we, chose, we are readers ourselves, and uh, uh, we do love classics, but we thought that there was potential, uh, just like others have mentioned and Simon has mentioned, to make them more approachable and uh, make them uh, more appealing to a wider audience. So uh, a lot of people, when they hear about classic books, uh, sometimes they feel uh, afraid that people are going to ask them if they have read them. Uh, they fear that they have missed out something uh, they haven't read. They might fear they're too complex. And we just thought that this is uh, the same. And uh, especially Dom Sawyer is a book that uh, appeals to both grown-ups and children, and even uh, Mark Twain himself in the introduction says that he hopes that a lot of children will enjoy reading this book, but he also hopes that grown-ups uh, will find things they will enjoy within the text. So, um, as a first stage, we, we thought that we could do a better job in presenting and making these books accessible. Uh, these books are in the public domain, you can uh, find them in other sources as well. You can find them in Gutenberg Project. But we thought that uh, while Gutenberg is a, uh, a great repository and source of information, uh, sometimes uh, it's not the ideal environment for a reader. It's very hard for you to read the book. Uh, it's very even painful. It's a painful experience. And uh, we thought that we could do a much better job in uh, 
creating a booking browser where uh, one can openly access this book, uh, share his notes, and then uh, we also thought about enriching it. And um, we didn't want to do it ourselves because then there's um, that's quite a big burden to do. So we approached literary experts and uh, we commissioned them. And we actually requested that anything that is done is not academic uh, and th that it should appeal to the to a wide aud a wider audience so we, we feel that by doing that uh, by f at first providing a, a, a clean and easy environment for people to just come and read and then if they choose to explore the content we provide them just enough information so they get a pretty good idea of what's going on within the book and as well as information around the book uh, we'll be able to make it more accessible for more people to enjoy yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think that goes right. It goes along with with Simon saying earlier about the the language in which we approach our audiences, and obviously one of the things that younger generations or most people want nowadays is a clean interface to engage with. And uh, while museums and archives are improving their interfaces and the way people engage with their collections, it's still slow going. Um, and then again, with uh, a limited amount of information, not everyone needs the full metadata record for an item or all the annotations for a text. They might, but you can also just give them a little. And if they want more, they can go find that as well. But then this comes to Marius and We Make Known, which is about finding this information in an automated way. And when you presented your idea during the, de the debate of whether or not of deciding which team should win, one of the jury members, who is a representative from a museum, said, if they can pull this off, every museum is going to be wanting something like this. So my question to you is for you to ask a question from the audience, because I know that you guys are in the need of museums or collections to work with. So maybe you can tell the audience what we make known needs to actually make this idea uh, become a reality, other than a developer, which you're also, also looking for as well. Uh, or full-time developer, yeah. So what do, what do you guys need? Is it different metadata models or just different collections? What is it you're looking for? Um, <laughs> hard, hard to tell. Um, yeah, because our project is pretty complex, um, it's an ongoing challenge, and a never-ending story, and we're always happy for every kind of support as a, be a museum with its content, as well as um, we have a click demo uh, in the back, and we would like to, to see you testing it and tell us how it feels for you, because we want to um, <coughs> getting better and, and find out what, what the audience need and what the institutions need. Yeah, and of course we need... <laughs> you need data. We need, yeah, data, but we need uh, programmers to play with this data. Yeah, it's, it's still a very complex idea that yeah. no one has been able to crack yet, at least in the cultural, in the cultural world. Um, and probably maybe an equally complex idea, or maybe the second most, not this competition, but Naus, using a technology that is just on the forefront of kind of being workable in a public setting, not just in a research institution. Um, my question for you guys, hmm. how would you like to see your project evolve over the next five years? Because you guys need to look ahead. You need, the, you need to catch up with technology, and the technology needs to cut up, catch up with you. So what would you like to see in five years? Mm -hmm. And maybe how you can connect it to cultural heritage. Because your while That's your so first there. demo at the <laughs> hackathon was all about heritage, your video was about a smart house. But how can you connect this to cultural heritage in five years? About the culture, yeah, I don't know yet, but what I left out of my presentation is why we're doing it uh, right now, why we think it's the perfect moment in time, and one point is just the research that is uh, going on, which we can just read and try to implement, but otherwise, the, just the devices that are needed, uh, yeah, I showed the picture, the device looked kind of ugly, it's still in development phase, but we're betting that in three to five years, um, devices will come out that are just headbands or maybe even integrated into glasses or whatever. 
um, so that people will actually wear it and be comfortable wearing it and yeah, not shy away from looking stupid with that thing on their head. And yeah, to, to develop the vision that we, we have now, we started with something completely different at the hackathon and now we're kind of at this phase and I feel good with the vision right now, but maybe it, it will change yeah, with new hardware, new development, new software as well. Yeah. About the culture, I'm still not sure how to connect to it, but... No, I, I, think, <laughs> I think it's there. I mean, you can change the way that at least museums can um, see how their audiences are, are responding, how a curator, can, a curator can get a better sense of how mm -hmm. people respond to their selections. Yes, and uh, I, what I mentioned, the market research yeah. aspect is just like, okay, we're doing research yeah. in the museum, what, what pieces actually evoke emotions if you're running around and several pieces are like really interesting, yeah, giving people emotions and others are just boring, and that might be very surprising to curators and yeah. Yeah, I'm interested in that as well. You can also tell if your friend is lying when they say, you know, I really like this piece of art. <laughs> I cried. Well, yeah. your brain <laughs> you says differently. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, Moshe. So you already know that I'm a fan of your, a fan of your, of your project. Um, but I, I think your incubation process has been pretty interesting. It's, you've kind of gone through different ways of, you started with a post art idea and then you were starting to go different ways and then it's now getting honed back in. So maybe you could elaborate how your idea has changed over the incubation process to where it is now. All right, uh, we started with museums and then uh, with Simon we thought that we would, it would be good to enlarge the audience and think about galleries as well. And um, the artists, I think that um, our project is very good, as I explained before. For the artists to get um, um, new audiences and vice versa. And um, also, when, when you go to the museum, um, I think that you you take you look at the picture, you look at the piece of art, and then um, you wish to share. We live in a world that if I don't share, it's as if I don't exist. Um, but when I talk about returning to analog, uh, I'm thinking also about leaving this aside and going outside to apps and um, platforms that in which you get to know new art and piece of art and um, in which you, um, you just send a postcard to someone you love. You don't have to go to the museum just for doing that. Okay, I understand. Um, what I like about this idea, or in, even your original concept is, um, the idea, you're right, the idea of sharing, and you know, you have someone like, oh yeah, I was in Spain. It's like, well, I didn't see any photos on Instagram, so how do I know yes. you were on Spain? And the idea is that, you know, you can just remember the painting that you saw, and then you can send the postcard later. You don't always need to share right away. And in a way, we also learned about the, the pop-up museum, of not having the phone be a, a distraction, but simply just a tool to convey something else, or to improve something else. Okay, so we've all done a round of questions. That went much faster than I thought, so thank you for keeping your answers. I, um, but I want you guys to have the floor, so are there maybe any questions from the audience? Otherwise, I have plenty more. D does anyone have a question currently? No. Is everyone tired? Yes, in the back, okay. I'm already doing it. No, thank you, George. Uh, Marco, sorry. I, I um, wanted to ask Paul from the Story Peaks because I, I really loved the idea behind uh, that, that project. And I was just, since it was uh, short, I would just simply uh, like to hear you talking more about how can we really um, bring life to, to bring art to our daily lives, as you said, and especially in the point of art therapy that really caught my attention. And, and congratulations, I really liked it very much. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Does this work? Yeah, it works. Thank you. Uh, yeah, 
uh, the book Art Therapy uh, is, was, for me, was a huge inspiration. I, I, if you, may, maybe you all read it, but if you don't, didn't, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful book, but it's also, it's, I thought it was very inspirational because sometimes we look at pictures and pic pictures are just pictures and they look pretty or not and they don't, that doesn't really engage you. And what Alain de Botton pro basically proposed, he posed the question, what is art for? And he said, it's a question that a lot of people can get angry about because, you know, art is for art and, and you know, it should be obvious. But I think it's a very relevant question because art has always played a role in our lives to not only to inspire us, but sometimes to guide us if, if we're a lo at loss about something. Um, sometimes art can help us to understand that this is not just you, it's universal and it's, it's something that's been, you know, played around in s over centuries. So I think actually posing that question is, is really, really important. And for me, this is also, you know, I sort of ventured back into art through this project and really looking at art pieces and what, what's it really about and what does it say about me? And um, yeah, I wouldn't say it changed my life, but <laughs> you know, it's, it's been really inspirational. And this is, has this is also become my inspiration to see all of these amazing uh, collections you know, you have to sort of elevate them. You have to put them on a pedestal and say, like, look at this. This is this is beautiful. This is amazing. And uh, and what does it what does it mean to you? And you know, and and like I said, if I hear a story, like a personal story about someone who relates to art in a in a certain way, that's when it comes comes alive for me. And sometimes you learn something from it. And sometimes you know, like there's <laughs> there's a whole series of things that he suggests that art can do. You know, like just calm you down a little bit. You know, relax. It's this. This is you know, like <laughs> we're not. The world's not uh, falling apart because we elected Trump. You know, like there's there's a lot of things that that uh, that sort of plays around in history. And I think we can learn a lot, a lot from art. And I think that's yeah. I think that's that's great. No, and I just also appreciated very much the idea that you started with saying that you are tired of archives and that you just, you just they, they can be boring very easily, and I totally agree. So I, I think it's the, the starting point for your project is especially relevant at these times because so we have so many of us, I mean, most of us are still dealing in archives, 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 and that's, that for me was very, very refreshing. So well, thank thanks you. a lot. Thank you. Anyone else have some questions? Is anyone maybe from an institution getting inspired as well? I hope so, um, because this has been a very inspiring process. And when we started this project almost three years ago, we had no idea what was going to come out of these hackathons. I'm very pleased to see the results as well. Um, but the floor is still yours, so I will keep up with the questions. Did anyone raise their hands? No, OK. Um, OK. Then maybe I'll ask the same question that I asked now, that I'll ask for all of you. If we want to be optimistic and we want to be all looking ahead five years from now, where do you see your project? Where do you see Picasso's cat in five years? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there are multiple options, but I think the most realistic one, it's uh, going to be a very convenient and useful tool for people and for kids, for example, as well, to learn about art. So I can imagine that you can use it in classes, like uh, if you're going about teenagers, right? So people like to play games, especially during the classes, or like pull off their, like pull out their phones and do stuff. But here they would actually have to take out their phones and learn about art during class, or it can become like an addictive game because you. <clears throat> It kind of hooks you up and you would like to continue learn something new. And so the idea is you don't really explicitly teach people about something. You just go on with the game. So they're not learning, but they're playing. And I really like this concept of being a game that's useful for something. So I see it in the future as a, as a very nice addictive game that hooks people on art. And they learn without realizing that they're learning. Well, we would like to become a successful and well-known magazine, of course, with a paper publication, maybe semestral. 
And our aim is also to become an artistic uh, and cultural association to engage the people with us more and more and make art more fun. Just a little plug, if you're not already liking Nora on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash nora.com. Yeah, so Nora you can. Nora.mag. Nora yeah. It's facebook.com slash Nora.mag. You should like it and invite all your friends as well. Um, so, Paul, five uh, years? Five years, yeah, that's a long time. I don't know how, te <laughs> how technology is going to evolve. Um, but yeah, like the, the graph uh, I showed before, how, how screens are evolving, how this uh, quality is, is evolving, I think it's really a canvas that we can use uh, in, in many different ways. And I think using that to actually present art to, to a really wide audience is amazing. And I, like, if I think of an image in, in the future, I would think of a, of a beautiful large screen somewhere in a public space that people gather around and, and interact with art, maybe in very different places in the world. I would be fascinated to hear uh, what uh, what a, a Japanese or uh, someone from Uganda or, or Brazil has you know relates to to an art piece uh, 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 that 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 I'm looking at, and I think Europe has you know has this enormous cultural heritage. So I think we almost have an obligation, or, or you know we, we should we should share that. And I, I think there's a lot of people who who would love to love to engage with that. So. Yeah, five years, I don't know. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, for Biblio, I think in five years, our main goal would be to, be, to build an active uh, reader base, add more titles, and we're also thinking of uh, expanding this to a marketplace, basically, after partnering with uh, uh, not only uh, with um, commercial publishers, uh, we'd love to partner with independent publishers and uh, offer our readers free access on the web, but then perhaps paid bundles or paid add-ons such as uh, Syncdotio and things like that. And we think uh, of building a platform where one can actually go read with no distractions and if he chooses to actually purchase the book without having to go to either iBooks, Amazon, without ever leaving the place, uh, he can frictionless, have frictionless, frictionless transactions of reading, sharing, and also buying things. So that's what we're trying to build. Are you guys taking requests? Requests? No. From whom? From, you know, just from. I mean, if, if, you, uh, if uh, enough people want the book, you know. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, first, as a first stage, we, we are a curated platform, so we get to choose our own titles. And ideally, we'll have uh, some people helping us do that. So. Uh, and with the encoding pro process. And uh, our first partners ideally would be independent publishers uh, that are more, more closer to our ideals. And uh, after that, we'll see how it goes. I mean, uh, our first uh, priority is to, uh, to have an active uh, reader base. And that's perhaps the hardest thing to do. Yeah. yeah. You should talk to Moshe yeah. afterwards. Uh, okay, Mar uh, uh, Marius, uh, five yeah, years? Five, five years. Um, I would like to, let's say, receive some love letters from, <laughs> <laughs> from people who use WeMakeNown. For example, a tourist um, who uh, went to the Louvre not because of uh, Mona Lisa, but because he found something in WeMakeNown, which is somewhere behind the corner or whatever or from a student um, who didn't have uh, five nerv nervous breakdowns while writing his papers because he used We Make Known, or institution who um, built up a new, um, um, <coughs> a new exhibition based on uh, what he found out uh, the, the audience would like to see. Something like that, that would be great. Yeah. You already, you already got the question. <laughs> so, well, it's hard to predict trends in five years. We yep. will be after Trump, for example. <laughs> um, but uh, I would say that uh, our platform will form a community of artists from all over Europe, from all over the world. And also, I'm thinking about the content, because I'm 
as you know, I'm a writer. So I think about the messages uh, that people would write, and uh, maybe they will form also a pattern or a, a more um, cosmopolitan story, which in our era of separatism is something that I wish for. Thank you. Um, OK. Well, I will say one final word. Um, but can we have a round of applause for our incubatees first? Um, so the European Space Project ends in February. Um, and that means that while European Space will continue in some capacity, the bulk of the project's work is, has ended. But these seven people and their teams will continue on because this is their passion. And it, it's not tied to EU funding. It's because it's something that they hopefully believe in doing and that they want to pursue for as long as they can until they have to maybe give up and get a real job. But <laughs> um, So I highly encourage everyone here, um, please share these projects via your institution's channels. Tell your colleagues if you haven't picked up a business card or follow them on Twitter or Facebook, please stay uh, in the loop. And we'll do our best to inform you of their progress as best we can. Um, but thank you all. It's been uh, it's nice to see how far you've come. And we'll talk more in depth tomorrow. But uh, I guess maybe we can call it early, unbelievably. 